Welcome, friends, to this uh, meditation workshop. We'll be experimenting with several small exercises which help us in achieving the goal of meditation, which is to discover ourselves, our true self. The goal of all meditation is to find out who we really are and why we are here. I, I, you might have noticed that they put a rocking chair for me. <laughs> I know there is a trick chair. There is a trick chair because in one of the earlier meditation sessions, when I was talking to the group about meditation, I was saying that during meditation, the tendency to sleep is very strong. And therefore, a lot of time, people go to sleep while they are meditating. Because the tendency for the attention to drop from the wakeful state at the eye level to the sleep state at the throat level is very strong. We sleep every night. Therefore, that tendency is automatic in us. During that meditation workshop, many of you were probably here. When I closed my eyes to lead the meditation group, after a while, I found that I was snoring myself. <laughs> and when I opened my eyes, everybody was staring at me like that. So they all enjoyed my snoring. <laughs> and this is a trick chair to see if I do it again. <laughs> because they believe that if I rock, I might sleep faster. <laughs> I am told that the subject for my talk this morning, before we go into the meditation sessions later in the day, is the art of healing. The healing arts that people are practicing. This is an important subject because so many people have asked me whether the different ways of healing that people are employing are consistent with the spiritual path. Should people who are following the spiritual path actually practice healing. It doesn't interfere with their spiritual progress. Is it proper for them to do it? So I thought it's a good time for me to make a few comments on the healing art that exists and their effect on the spiritual path. As you know, the healing is of many kinds. There's physical healing, there is sub-astral healing, there is astral healing, there is mental healing, and there is spiritual healing. People practice different kinds of healing. The physical healing is practiced by all the doctors, modern doctors, who diagnose what the disease is and prescribe a drug which should counteract that disease. Most of these systems of modern medicine, of healing, are called the allopathic system of healing. The word allopathic is derived from the Greek origin, which means allopathos, that means changing of the pathos, changing of the state of being. If you are sick, give something that should counter it. If you are having a fever, give uh, or information, give an antibiotic which should reduce the fever. It's like opposing the force of the disease by healing with the opposite force, so it's called allopathy. There's also a practice called homeopathy. Homeopathy means creating a similar pathos, homeopathos. That means similar, cure similar. The founder of that system, Samuel Hahnemann, lived a couple of hundred years ago in Germany, and he founded the system based on the principle similia similibus curantur. That means similar will cure similar. And it's not that the opposite will cure. Opposite will give you relief. But for cure, he thought you have to have a similar thing. That means if the disease creates certain symptoms on your body, give something that would create similar symptoms in a healthy body. And when the uh, disease expresses itself in the language of symptoms, you can read the language of the symptoms, and that is the language of the disease, and not the kind of uh, 
diagnosis that the allopaths made. So homeopathic system became quite prominent at one time, and it's coming back into being again. It's coming into popularity again, and is based on this principle that whatever illness can be caused artificially in a healthy body by giving any kind of substance, the same substance in a very diluted form will be able to cure the same disease. And that is very popular in some countries, especially in Germany, in France, in India, and now coming back into the United States. There are other systems uh, which are also well known. The uh, Ayurvedic system is one of the oldest systems, started from the Vedic times and is traced back to history of six or seven thousand years. And there are some prescriptions written down in old uh, literature which are supposed to be several thousand years old and are still being used by the practitioners of Ayurveda today. A similar system was started in Greece called the Unani system. These two systems of healing employ what they call the three different doshas, the three different aspects in which the body survives and that three doshas they consider are uh, pitta which is the hot dosha and there is kapha which is the phlegm in us and then there is the vata which is the air. They think that with these three doshas we can diagnose anything. They depend very heavily, these two systems of healing, the Ayurvedic system and the Yunani system, they employ the diagnosis by reading the pulse of a person. Practitioners still today are employing the system by which they can see the wrist of a person and put their fingers, three fingers they put on the wrist at an appropriate place just below the wrist and the three doshas are read immediately by the three fingers. And you can see the way the pulse beats, you will notice that the pulse beat is different at the three different positions. And on that basis they can diagnose and the treatment is based upon a diagnosis of that kind. The Ayurvedic system is using more of the uh, basams, that means oxidi oxidized materials of metals, minerals, and so on, which have been proven to relieve uh, different kind of illnesses. So it's a popular system in the East. The Yunani system relies upon more of what they call the syrups and the cold drinks, because it was in a hot area and they thought that all medicine should be given in the form of nice cold drinks or in the kind of uh, kushtas, that means uh, you make a preparation, concoctions uh, of pastes of different kinds. So there's little difference in the type of uh, material they use in the healing. All these systems employ the physical body, analysis of the physical body, reading the pulse of the physical body, taking vital signs of the vital body parts, and then prescribing a treatment. This is all healing by the physical methods of the physical body. Then comes the sub-astral healing, sometimes called the psychological healing, psychic healing, and th those include several kinds of healing methods, Reiki being very popular here, where you have two kinds of hands on and hands near the body, you can touch the body, give certain kind of massages, and that heals the body, or you can pass your hand with your energies for the body. Because these types of healing involve the energies, most of the time the energy of the healer is being used to cure. And in many cases, the disease affects the healer. I once attended a conference uh, of uh, in the Spiritual Frontiers Fellowship, and they thought I was a healer. And therefore they put me in a group of healers, about 20 healers who are practicing the Reiki and other kinds of healing systems. And I must tell you, all those 20 were sick themselves. So one of the first principles of healing is healer, heal thyself. If you are sick, and I, I questioned them, I said, look, if you are healing other people, you're sick yourself. What's, what uh, standard do you set for other people? You must be first healing yourself. If you can't heal yourself, how do you heal others? 
In later discussions, we discovered that many of them were suffering from the same diseases they were trying to cure. Based on the law of karma, it appears that uh, when you heal through subastral energies, you take on the karma of the person you are healing. And therefore, it's not advisable to do that kind of healing, which transfers the karma. It's not easy to transfer karma of one person to another, but those methods of healing very often transfer, and the healers themselves become sick. And therefore, uh, it's not a very good system, and uh, although it's practiced widely, it interferes with the spiritual progress of, who's, of any person who is on a spiritual path. These sub-astral healings are then followed by the astral healings, which is through sense perceptions only. So those involve a lot of uh, suggestive powers, psychological suggestions, psychiatric treatments, and so on, where the power of suggestion is used to heal. There also, the danger is that in dealing with a patient who you are trying to heal, you are picking up some of the karma of that patient. That is why the suicide rate amongst the psychiatrists is the highest amongst all group of people in the country. Those who are trying to cure other people of their mental illnesses themselves get so depressed that they can't survive because as they heal through psychological and psychiatric methods, they get those same symptoms themselves. These are also uh, not very, very good for practice of the spiritual path. <coughs> then there's a the mental healing, which of course is they use mental kindnesses, mental power of moving things, and so they use the power to move things in the body. And those also uh, hurt the mind of the person who's trying to practice these. These kinds of healings have all these deleterious effects on the healer. But there is a healing called spiritual healing, which is healing with love. Healing with love is a spiritual thing because your soul is involved and neither your mind, nor your senses, nor your body is involved. <clears throat> Prayer from the spirit very often helps in healing. We have seen so many cases where prayer from the spirit heals somebody. That does not cause any harm to the one who is healing and helps the person who is being healed. Does not transfer karma, but lightens the karma of that person because the healing is taking place from the spirit which is beyond the karma. Our spiritual self is not bound by karma. It lies in parbrahm, beyond trikuti, beyond the domain of the mind and domain of karma. When we talk of the law of karma, it only operates from the mental level of our mind. All karma is stored on the mind, is played out from there. Therefore, the healing that is done from any part of the consciousness that is beyond the mind does not cause any deleterious effect. Indeed, very often, it helps you to be compassionate with people and use your compassion and love for people, pray for them with love, coming from your, what they call heart, which is actually the spirit. And that is a good way of helping people. I have suggested to many healers who are practicing healing through the energies to shift to healing with love. It has benefited them a lot. And their own health has improved, as well as the health of those who they tried to heal. So these healing arts, there are so many kinds of them, and they, as I mentioned to you, some of them do interfere with our uh, spiritual growth, and some of them do not. So those that do not interfere are those where we do not transfer any of the karma to ourselves. Because when karma is transferred, it creates an additional burden for us. We already are all overladen with karma. Now, one word about karma I should mention, because uh, all sickness and disease is a result of karma. It's our own actions of the past that causes these things to happen. Nobody has inflicted those on us. We have inflicted them upon ourselves. We do not remember them, and therefore we sometimes wonder how it is unfair for so many people to be born healthy, lead healthy lives, and so many people spending so much of their time in hospitals and dying there. 
but it's all their own karma, not somebody else's. The law of karma explains uh, these uh, events better than any other theory that we have found so far. There is no way to say that if God has created all of us as equal children, why should there be so much difference? Some are born poor, some are born rich, some are in good state of health, some are not in a good state of health. What causes all this difference? Surely the Creator who loves all creation could not have made that difference. It is part of a lower story, a story at the lower level of our own minds where we have created these actions. Incidentally, karma is not created by a physical action. Karma is created by a mental action. That means if you think of something in your mind, karma is created right there. It, even if you don't translate it into physical action, the karma is still there. Therefore, if you look at your own minds, where does this wire go? Where does it go? You missed half the talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the, the karmic condition into which we are now situated makes us go through the karma because we have identified ourselves with the mind. We have identified ourselves with the sensory system. We have identified ourselves with the body. And that is why <coughs> what the mind plays out becomes our experience. And therefore we feel the sickness, disease that comes to us because we are associating ourselves so closely with the mind. The mind and our soul are so closely locked in together that it's very difficult even to distinguish between the two. It takes quite a while and meditation practice to know that we were never the mind. Mind was just a machine given to us to use, the thinking machine. And it is placed next to us and we power it with our consciousness and our soul and it functions. But the mind alone contains all the karma. The so-called Akashic records or Akashic records which you refer to often are all stored in the mind. There is nothing stored in our soul. Our soul is beyond karma. It's pure consciousness and is not carrying any of this thing. But when we identify ourselves with our minds and our bodies, we go through this whole process and that is why we suffer. And the karma is our own creation through our own mind, through mental action. Now if we try to uh, wipe out karma, <coughs> if we think that by healing you wipe out karma, you do not wipe out karma. You transfer karma, you postpone karma. It is only postponed, it is not trans it is not healed in a way, it is not gone away, it doesn't go anywhere. The only way for karma to be destroyed is to do meditation of the soul, of the spirit, which can burn karma. That is why perfect living masters who have come here and give us the beautiful gift of initiation, of which I have I have not come across any equivalent gift in this world. It's the best gift one can get. That gift includes the burning down or the complete elimination of all the previous karma. And the only karma you go through is that which is of this current life. It's a very big advantage to have all the old karma gone away so that even if you have to live again, even if you have to have a second life, it is based only on the karma of one life which is this present life. That's a very big advantage. But the karma plays out in several ways. It can play out in the physical disease, in physical happiness, in physical winning a lottery, in getting a promotion, winning something. It can be both positive and negative. And that karma goes through in our physical life. It can also be in mental life. It can also be in our emotional life. We can be emotionally so upset and it's a past karma that we are paying. It does not have to be a physical karma. Then it can be so mental that you are mentally un unstable, you are mentally sad, depressed. That also is past karma. But there is no karma relating to the spirit which performs its own functions independently. The functions of the mind is to think to rationalize, to make sense of the sense perceptions, to articulate, 
to speak, to speak, to write, to communicate. These are all functions of the mind. And these functions are affected by karma. But the functions of the soul, which are love, beauty, joy, intuition, intuitive knowledge, they are not affected by karma at all. And that is why those who live in the spirit live a life of love and beauty and joy and all their actions are based upon intuitive knowledge. They do not incur any karma. In fact, they are living beyond karma. And when a master initiates us, when a perfect living master initiates us, he does not do so from any mental level. He does it from the spiritual level. And since he does it from the spiritual level, he has the power to wipe out the karma that we are holding. In case of very severe karma, that we are, that's not based upon previous lives, but is being gone through in this particular life. If it is very unbearable and we pray to our master, he relieves us even in that case and gives us relief. So the master's work is done entirely from above the mind, from the spirit. And therefore it's a spiritual healing that we get from the master. We can also practice the same thing, spiritual healing. In fact, if we practice our meditation regularly, properly, and attain a state where we can find out who we are, that means attain a state above the mind, which we can all attain. It's a question of practice. If we attain that state, we will ourselves be just like the masters. And our healing touch for other people will be operating from there and we'll be doing exactly what masters can do. In fact, these people who go beyond the mind, we call them gurmukhs. To distinguish them from those who are not gone there, we call them manmukhs. Manmukh means one who follows his mind, and gurmukh means one who follows his guru, or the master. And the one who follows the master, or the gurmukh, has the same status as the master. The only difference between a gurmukh and the master is the master does additional work of initiating other people, and the Gurmukh does not. Otherwise, there is not much difference between the two. So anybody can attain the status of the same status in spirituality as a master. In fact, the master comes here not to make you better people. He does not come here to make you wiser people. He comes here to make you exactly like himself. That's his job. They, refer to the master as the philosopher's stone. The philosopher's stone is supposed to touch base metal and make it into gold. And they say the difference between a philosopher's stone and the master is the philosopher's turn, uh, stone turns base metal into gold, whereas a master turns a base metal into the philosopher's stone itself so that they can become the, like the same. They have the same experiences which a master has. So this is a great opportunity uh, for practice of higher meditation. And they call it higher meditation because it's a meditation that goes higher than the mind. That's the only reason why I call it higher meditation. Otherwise, uh, to come to think of it, there's nothing high or low about it. When we classify these things and we put them in a certain order, the tendency is to make them uh, low and high. Actually, the actual situation of uh, the different levels of consciousness is not designed that way. It is not designed to be one above the other. It is designed to be one inside the other. So it's like peeling of an onion and you come to the inner part of the onion. It's like that. You peel off your awareness of the outer body and you keep on going further and further into an awareness of your own true self. So that is why the <clears throat> master's way of healing, or a gurumukh's way of healing, is spiritual and does not cause any harm. Indeed, it is a help on the spiritual path. So I refer to all these methods of healing so that uh, you should be cautious that when you are practicing healing of various kinds, some of them which involve the energies in your body can bounce back and give you the same karmic symptoms that are thought, uh, thought to be cured by your healing process. On the other hand, 
if your healing involves only your love and compassion and comes from the heart or the spirit and not from your mind, not from the energies, then that's a help to the, to the person you are healing and also help to yourself. So make a distinction. Also, I have advised many people who are practicing healing of different kinds that they need not change the style of their healing, they only change the intent of their healing. That means, instead of saying, I use my energy to heal you, they say, I use my compassion and love to heal you. And therefore, their internal consciousness, which switches from using energy to heal, switches to using love and compassion to heal. And outwardly, there need not be much change. And that has worked well also. In many cases, I get reports back from the healers how much their life has changed because of the switch from healing with energy to healing with love and compassion. So I thought you would uh, be interested in uh, uh, these uh, differences. If you agree, we can start the meditation session now. How many of you are ready for it? How many of you are not ready for it? <laughs> Well, you came for the meditation workshop, I believe you are already. <clears throat> In these two days of the meditation workshop, I plan to do some exercises which I often do as a means of uh, preparing ourselves for meditation. These are preparatory exercises and they are not real meditation. When we come to real meditation, I will let you know it's only a preparation. The first exercise which I find very popular is called the orange juice experiment. How many of you have done that before? Orange juice experiment. How many of you have never done it? Oh, okay, you'll enjoy it. In the orange juice experiment, we imagine that our body is made of glass and it's hollow inside. Only the outer structure of the body is there and it's made of glass, transparent glass, and inside is hollow. And by imagination, we fill up the body with orange juice. Once it's filled up to the top of the head, then we discover that there are some valves attached to our fingers on the hands and to the toes of our feet. Then you press those fingers, the orange juice escapes from there. And so we are able to vacate the orange juice from our body at will by just pressing our fingers. Or later on, when the juice goes down, by putting pressure on the toes. So this is an experiment really designed to show how our attention can be made to move anywhere on the body. This is the main intention of the exercise, to begin to have control over your own attention because we will be using the same process later on for meditation. So please close your eyes, sit upright, and imagine that your body is now made of glass. If you move too much, it will crack. You can't afford that. So therefore, no movement during this exercise. Whatever position you adopt now, make sure you can hold on to it for a few minutes. And with your imagination, Fill up this body with orange juice, starting from the feet all the way up and leave no part unfilled and make sure, check it over and over again till you are sure the entire body is filled up with orange juice, right to the top of the head. With your attention, scan the whole body that from your feet to the head is completely filled up with orange juice, which you can see clearly. Now very gently press the fingers of your hands to allow the orange juice to escape very slowly. Orange juice should be allowed to drip out, drop by drop, and watch its level in the head. 
when the level drops to the eye level, stop. Hold there. Very slowly, not too fast. Drop by drop, let the orange juice come out from your fingers. And as the fingers are releasing the orange juice, the level is dropping from the head. When it comes to the eye level, exactly behind the eyes, stop. Slowly, hold at the eye level, no more dripping. Hold, relax your hands, no more pressure on the fingertips. Hold at the eye level and see the surface of the orange juice behind the eyes. See that you can see the orange juice having a surface just behind the eyes and the top of the head is now empty. There is nothing in the top of the head. <clears throat> now press the fingers again, allow the orange juice to, to drop through the fingers till you reach the level of the tip of the nose. When you reach that level, stop and hold there. Slowly. Now look back and see that the top of the head, right, even behind the eyes is all empty. The level of the orange juice has gone down to the level of the nose, tip of the nose. Very gently press your fingers again, allow the orange juice to drop to the level of your lips and your mouth. When it reaches there, stop. Now very gently press your fingers again, allow the orange juice to come down to the level of your throat. When it reaches the throat level, hold it there. And look back and see that the whole of the head is empty. Hold at the throat level. Now press your fingers again gently and allow the orange juice to come down to the heart level. And you will see that the orange juice is escaping from the arms also. Shake your right arm and let all the orange juice escape from the right arm. Shake your left arm all the orange juice go down from the left arm. Check both arms are now empty. Hold at the heart level. Now press the toes of your feet to release the orange juice from the feet now because there is no juice in the hands of the arms anymore. So you have to use the feet now. Press the toes of the feet, allow the orange juice to come down to the level of your navel, middle of your belly, and hold it there.
Now press the toes of the feet again and allow the orange juice to go down to the bottom of your torso and co completely evacuate the whole of the torso and see that the orange juice is only left in the legs. <coughs> Now press the toes of your right foot only and allow the orange juice to flow out from the right leg till the right leg is completely empty. You can shake it a little to see it's completely empty. Now press the toes of the left leg and allow the orange juice to flow. You can press hard. Let the whole orange juice flow out and make sure, shake the left leg, that there is no orange juice in the left leg. Scan the whole body and see from head to foot there is no orange juice. If you find orange juice sticking anywhere, shake that part of the body slightly so it is released and you press the fingers and the toes to make sure all the orange juice has gone out of the body and the body is clean and empty. Now keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes and welcome back to the workshop. How many of you were able to do this successfully as a encounter? How many were unable to do it? Halfway. <laughs> Halfway? Okay, next time we'll make it full way. Okay. <clears throat> I don't see any orange. Are we supposed to see the color? You didn't see any color? No. What did you see? It's kind of a blur. Yeah, I hear you talking, but I don't see any orange. Okay, we'll substitute for some other fruit next time. Now you must have seen what was the purpose of doing this exercise. The purpose was that your attention was drawn to different parts of your body. And as you took the orange juice to those levels, your attention went there. This is a very significant thing that the whole of the meditational practice which gives you experience all the way to your real self is based upon the use of your attention. And if you practice this, where to keep your attention, especially in the body, it will help you very greatly in the meditation practice. You might also have noticed, some of you might have noticed that the orange juice stuck to some parts of the body more than other parts, and were more difficult to get rid of it. How many had that experience? You will notice that the parts where the orange juice was stuck is generally the part of your body, of your anatomy, where there is some problem. This is also a way of self-diagnosis of what part of your body has a problem. So it's very interesting that you can check for yourself <coughs> that some part of your body needs attention. So these are just two benefits of doing this exercise. And I, Jewel says she didn't see the orange juice. Would you have any suggestion of using some other fruit juice or some other colored liquid? The reason why I chose orange juice was <coughs> it is, color is well recognized, orange color, and it's sticky. And so I thought that will be good experience uh, in an imaginary exercise like that. Had anybody had difficulty with orange juice? Yes. Chuck. I would uh, <clears throat> suggest that they, instead of using orange juice, use the black yucky yuck and the white energy coming from heaven going into the body. And as the trainers releases the yucky yuck, the cleansing part purifies the body. It's a very visual. That's a good suggestion. Maybe we'll try that. You want to say something? I also 
Okay, two suggestions have come uh, that instead of orange juice, we should use yucky yucky black stuff. <laughs> and then instead of seeing it go empty, we should replace it with clear white liquid coming from the top and replacing the black yucky yucky. How many are in favor of this new thing? Two votes. How many don't like this new idea? You're, sorry, you're outvoted. <laughs> how about milk? How about milk? How, how, how about milk? Instead of uh, orange juice, we fill up the body with milk. Anybody in favor of that? Anybody against? No vote. <laughs> so I think uh, for the time being, we stick to orange juice. <laughs> Maybe later on we'll improve the exercise. Now this was just an exercise to handle our attention, which is very, very important because it's the focusing of attention that we are used to. We focus attention on so many things. We have no experience really of withdrawing attention. We have experience of focusing attention on different parts of the body like we just did. But we do not have an experience of withdrawing attention. That's a different exercise. Focusing. And that's the secret of good meditation, is not focusing attention. It is to know what attention is and withdraw it to the point from where it is coming. When you put your attention on something, if somebody is talking to you, you want to hear him, you turn your head like this. Yes, what did you say? You don't necessarily turn your head because you want to look with the eyes, you would turn your head for music. You turn your head because of the ears, eyes, everything put together draws your attention in a particular way. So where does this attention come from? Have you ever considered that the attention that you focus on different things, where is it originating from? If you contemplate only this question, where does what is the origin, original point from where attention flows out? you will come to know it comes from the head. Not only from the head, it comes from the center of the head and flows out or is activated through the sense perception of the eyes, ears, and so on, the movement of the head. All these are used for the attention to focus on something, but originating from the center of the head. Withdrawal of attention would mean that you put your attention to the point from where it's coming up. Now, we never practice that, therefore it's difficult. And that's why meditation becomes difficult. But with practice, it will be as easy as focusing attention on something outside of yourself. And this is the key. We will be practicing a lot in the afternoon and uh, also tomorrow, how to withdraw attention to where it belongs. And that is what makes you discover yourself. Because yourself is generating the attention that's going out at all levels. So attention is very important. And, uh, uh, but the sense perceptions which we have adopted as part of our body's experiences, they are independent from the body. What? We think that we only see because we have these eyes. But how do we see dreams? How do we see things in imagination? Is that not seeing? It's still seeing. What is seeing? Seeing is not these eyes at all. When we can see something without these eyes, how can we say it's only these eyes that can see? If you can, in an imagination, see something, you, if in a dream you can see something, these eyes are not seeing something in a dream. So therefore, the seeing, yes, perception of seeing, is different from seeing through the eyes. Now we similarly smell, similarly taste, similarly touch, tactile sense. All the sense perceptions that we are accustomed to using, we are associating with different organs of the body. Indeed, they are not. They can function independently too. Now we are not, we are not used to it, of senses functioning independently, because we have been growing up in our bodies thinking that all the sense perceptions are because of the sense organs in the body. Now I want to demonstrate to you in the next exercise that the sense perceptions function independently of the body. 
Now that's again an imaginary exercise, and you will see how imagination works to generate all the sense perceptions without having to uh, use the eyes or this body at all. So in this next exercise, you will close your eyes and imagine that there is a table next to you where you are sitting. And on the table lies a vase or a vase, if you call it, of flowers. And your favorite flowers are in that vase. And then there is a plate of a snack that is favorite snack of yours. And there is a drink in a glass, in a tumbler, a drink lying there. And as I will direct you, you will pick up one of these at a time and see what experience you have of them in pure imagination. Not with these eyes, not with these ears, not with any of this. So close your eyes and imagine that next to you is a table on which lies a vase of flowers and next to it is a drink in a, in a cup, in a tumbler, and next to that is a plate or a saucer on which some favorite snacks of yours are lying. And you are sitting comfortably next to these things on your table. Now pick up the vase of flowers and bring it in front of you. See, it's a glass vase. Knock, on the fing knock with a finger on the vase and see if it makes ting ting sound to show it's made of glass or is it plastic. Check, did you hear the sound and found out whether it's glass or plastic? Now look at the flowers in the vase. What color are they? Look at the shape, the flowers. Are these your favorite flowers? Are they something new? Have you seen these flowers before? Have you seen these colors before? Bring the flowers close to your nose and smell them. See what fragrance they have. Is it familiar to you, this fragrance of these flowers? Have you had that smell before? Do you recognize it? Look at the flowers again. Are they still the same flowers or have they changed? What do they look like now? What color do they have? Now put the flowers back on the table. Pick up your drink and see is it in a glass tumbler or plastic? Knock on it again. Is it glass, plastic, styrofoam? Look at the color of the drink, if you can see it. Take it to your lips and taste it. A little sip of it. Is it a familiar taste? Have you had that taste before? Take another sip. Taste it again. Has it changed? Is it still the same taste? Put the drink back on the table. Pick up the plate of your favorite snack. Look at the snack. Is it your favorite? How often have you had it? Taste it. How does it taste? Do you like it or dislike it? Would you like to change it? Is it still the same snack? Put it back on the table. Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes 
welcome back. How many of you were able to do this exercise successfully? Oh, I think the eating things are easy to do. <laughs> How many of you were able to see the flowers? How many of you were able to smell the flowers? How many of you were able to see whether the vase was made of glass or plastic? How many of you were able to taste the drink that you had? How many of you were able to enjoy the snack that you had? Very good result. How many of you still have the taste of the snack in your mouth? <laughs> Isn't it amazing? You did all this through your imagination. And yet the sensory perception was identical to what you would do if you had the other thing. How many of you saw flowers that you had never seen before? So many. Isn't that amazing? That it was not what you could remember. It's something different. How many of you found the flowers change during the exercise? Isn't that amazing? The physical flowers never change. When you see them with your eyes, these flowers changed. How many of you had an unusual experience with this? Either with the snack or would you like to share? The smell is different. It's something that's familiar, but I've never smelled it in my life, but I, I know that it's familiar. But it, you never smelled it in your life? Not in my life, but it's something was it good? Yes. You enjoyed it? Yes, it was good, but it was, it was strange that I, I never smelled that particular smell. It was Interesting. Very good that you never smelled in your life and you smelled it today. Interesting. Yes, uh, Gary? Uh, I first saw the vase with the flowers and they were red and they seemed to be like little suns. And then when you, when you uh, said to look at them again, after uh, you know, we smelled them and what have you, they turned into a, a landscape of flowers, mm -hmm. which were red, and they were not the normal landscape, they were kind of other world landscape. Very good. I'm happy to hear you went into the other world for a little while. <laughs> the truth is, you all went into the other world. The truth is that these experiences did not take place in the physical body at all. The truth is, all these experiences took place in the sensory body, in the astral body. And all sense perceptions, even in the physical body, take place because of the astral sense perceptions. But we associate them with the physical body. In fact, we can see more with the astral eyes than we can with the physical eyes. It's the astral eyes that make us see through the physical eyes. We don't recognize it, that if we were to completely give up the awareness of the physical body, we would have all the senses intact completely. Indeed, the, sec the sense perceptions are themselves the structure of the astral body. There's no body as such. The sense perceptions retain even the shape and the feeling of a body, and therefore that is the astral body. What we call imagination here looks imaginary, not because it's truly imaginary, but because we have adopted this level of reality as the only reality, and therefore the rest is all imaginary. Supposing your attention goes to that and is withdrawn from this, that will become your only reality. That is the astral experience, that you really go into a, an experience of perceptions, sensory perceptions, which are not connected with the physical body, and yet they are equally strong. In fact, they're stronger. You see brighter colors, and you see brighter, you have unusual smells, you have unusual experiences in the astral self, which you never had here. All the experiences that you have in the physical system here in the physical body are arising from the astral experience. They are the original ones, and we are having copies and reflections of those in the physical body, and yet we think this is the only reality, because we are caught up in this level of experience, and we think this is the only reality. Through meditation, you can vacate the body and put your attention on the astral self, and you will see the astral self will be more real than even the physical body that you ever had. So that's the first step in our, uh, in our exercises. 
So I'm glad that you were able to experiment with this. Any, any difficulty you had in this exercise or in the first? Yes, Dickie. Well, when I, when I looked at the vase of flowers on the table, they were all different and there was a lot of different flowers. And then when I brought it in front of you, there was only one. And then I had trouble. Sometimes I would see it and it would fade away and then it would come and go. What do you think was happening? Exactly. Attention was straying. And the attention strays, things seem to change or seem to withdraw, disappear and reappear. It's a game of attention. Same thing happens in meditation. In meditation, you have certain experiences which come and go. Till the attention gets used to a certain experience, it seems to float away and come back again. Even when the radiant form of the master appears, in meditation, even that form appears and seems to disappear in the beginning. And sometimes it seems to withdraw to a distance and sometimes comes close. It's all, there's nothing moving actually, it's our attention. Our attention creates this distortion of an experience. And we think that experience is moving, actually our attention is creating that. So you are right in your analysis. Anybody else? Yes. What if you were blind from birth and you've never seen anything? How would your astral senses form, or would it form anything within? You would see very clearly. The blindness is of the physical eyes and not of the astral eyes. So you wouldn't have to see it in real at one time? Not at all, because, it? no, because this looks like this is the real thing and we are remembering <coughs> from here and seeing those things. The truth is, the astral sight is there, therefore we can see, and if we are blind, we are not using that astral sight. So if a person would improve his, his attention, could almost see what we would see in the astral level inside. Exactly. Not only that, blind people have been able to see, even when they were blind, after first having seen with the astral eyes. And that's an amazing thing. Of course, we think that blind people, born blind, are totally unable to see because they were born blind. On the other hand, they use the same terminology, I can see. Now, when we hear them say, I can see you, we think they are saying because they can touch your face with their hands, and it's the tactile perception that they are converting into sight. It's not exactly that. They have their own vision, and they see they see slightly differently than we see with the physical eyes because the astral eyes see more than the physical eyes can see. And so when blind people see and describe something, they can describe very clearly some of the scenes. Uh, I read a very interesting story of two patients, terminally ill patients, who were in a hospital. And one had a bed next to the window and the other had a bed next to him. There were two beds in that hospital room. And the man, they were both terminally ill, but they talked to each other occasionally. And the man next to the window would describe to the next person, look, today a parade is going on outside, and I can see it, it's beautiful, people are carrying flags, they're marching, and the man next couldn't see but he enjoyed the stories which the man next to the window was telling him. Eventually, every day he would entertain him that new scenes are now going on outside the window. Some he is seeing new parades going on, new people walking there. Very clear descriptions he would give of what is happening outside. Then that person near the window passed away, he died. And this man said, can I shift to the, to the bed on the window so I can see now? And he shifted to the window and he found there was just a wall outside. There was nothing outside. <laughs> he said, how come that man used to describe everything to me? He said, didn't you know he was totally blind from birth? Well, that's an interesting story which tells us something. He was describing things so clearly he was blind from birth. And the nurse said, didn't you know that? He was totally blind from birth. So the seeing that we talk about is taking place because these sense perceptions, all of them, 
are occurring at the level of the astral body. The astral body is responsible for sense perceptions. These different bodies which we say, the physical body, the astral body, the causal body, they are all performing certain functions. The physical body performs the important function of cre creating material physical reality for us and making that as the only reality. It's a great function that this body can do. The astral body provides all the sense perceptions and embeds them into the physical body so that we think because we have eyes we can see and that if we see through imagination it's only what we have seen before. But as you will hear from all the people who had experiences, these were just examples, they have seen things which they've never seen before. They have seen the colors of flowers change, they've never seen in physical life. They have just had a smell which he never had in his life, had today for the first time. So the power of perception through senses of the astral body far exceeds that which is permitted by the embed, embedding of those very sense perceptions in the physical body. It's an experiment worth doing that when you really vacate your body, physical body of its attention and move into the astral body, you'll find your sense perceptions much stronger than you ever had before. You look at the sky, you look at the very things around you here in the physical world, and the sky is more blue and beautiful than you've ever seen before. That everything is shining with a radiance you've never seen in the physical world. And you can see the same physical things in a different way. You can also have a deeper vision. You can see through the walls. You can see through people. You can see transparent people and they become transparent as you look at them. They become solid as you think of them. You look beyond them, you, they become transparent. You look at them, they become solid. This is only possible with the astral eyes. This is not possible with physical eyes. There are so many experiences like that which you will encounter yourself. Meditation is a great adventure in order to know who we really are, what faculties we have, which are hidden inside us. And we never use them. Because we think that the physical world of reality is the only world, the only reality. And we are trapped into this reality and unable to have the experiences that are available right inside our own body, right inside our own head, right inside our own consciousness. So this meditational experience opens up experiences which are unimaginable. They go beyond, way beyond our imagination. And yet they are our experiences, not somebody else's. The spiritual practice that I am talking about does not depend on anybody else's experience. It depends entirely on your own experience. What, whatever experience you have, you only believe that. You do not need to believe anybody's stories. You do not believe what is written in the books till you experience it yourself. So that's why it's a very practical path. The spiritual path of the great master was totally practical that see what you can see and then say I've seen it. Experience something and then say I've experienced it. So therefore, this uh, sensory system that you have is one of the systems that operates by itself and is embedded in the physical system. So physical body is merely a reflection of the astral. All things that you're seeing here around you are being generated because they exist in the astral plane. Everything that you can possibly experience here in the physical world exists in its prime quality, in its original form in the astral world. It's a world. It's a complete universe like this one, bigger universe than this. And you can go and travel in that. Now when you were in the when you are in the astral body, you don't have any weight, no gravity, no problem of dieting. You don't need food. You can eat food for taste. You you can stay the same age, the same form that you adopt at the time of meditation. Or you can change. How can you do any of these things here? We are stuck here. We are in a prison here. We don't realize this physical body is a prison. It has taken away all our freedom. And we are eternally very free. If we regain our freedom, we can get all the experiences that belong to us. Nobody has to give it to us. They are already there with us. So that's why. I'm sure, based on these incentives, you would all try uh, to good meditation, to 
today, tomorrow, and hereafter. These, all these doors of new experiences will open up to you. Okay, I'll give you a little time for any other questions and answers. Uh, I said questions and answers because uh, you can ask questions or you can give answers. <laughs> I know every person who has a question also has an answer. <laughs> Indeed, we all have answer to our own questions. When we ask a question, if you did not have somewhere an answer lurking in your consciousness, you could not formulate that question. It's as simple. And when, if I give you a nonsensical answer, you say, that's not it. If I give an answer that makes sense to you, you say, that's it. That means you knew the answer. You did not verbalize it. You did not speak it out even in your mind, but the answer was there. Anyway, let's deal with the questions and answers. Yes. I've got, I've got my answer. <laughs> That's a good example. Yes. So, a real life dream that seems um, as life would be here on this plane is a dream. The astral body, like lots of times, it's so it's technicolor. You can taste, you can smell, you can float. You can float as fast as you want in your sleep. And you know, we're supposed to be in our throat consciousness, but is that is that an astral? That's a sub-astral experience. Yeah, we distinguish between the sub-astral experience. The difference between the sub-astral experience and the astral experience is that when you go from the sub-astral and wake up, it is dreamlike. The rules and laws that govern sub-astral experience are not the same as of physical experience or astral experience. In the case of the sub-astral experience, for example, you skip from one scene to another rapidly. And it looks sensible in the dream. Sometimes it doesn't look sensible. <laughs> and so uh, the rules apply differently. Although you can have some experiences drawn from the physical and the, and the astral, like flying, like jumping off cliffs and not getting hurt, you can have a dream like that. And sometimes you can have dreams which are uh, totally irrational, but they make rationality while the dream is going on, and they become irrational when we wake up. But they are sub -astral. Some dreams are indeed astral, and they do not take place at the throat center. Some dreams can be dreams that are arising from above the eye center and not below. What about like when you were almost going to be killed and suddenly you just use the five names, repeat them in your dream rapidly, and the whole thing comes to an end and you wake up? Is that a sub astral or would that be an astral dream? It depends. It depends. Sometimes it can be sub astral. And if you can remember the five names, you are lucky. Sometimes you forget. <laughs> so, but you do wake up anyway. So that's a, that's a good thing. But from the physical dreamlike state, which is also a dreamlike state, we cannot wake up so easily into the astral state. Uh, we do get into the astral state when the physical body decays and is finished somehow. But the astral dream has this characteristic. It has not only technical or different colors, it contains colors which normally don't occur in a subastral dream, and those are blue and yellow. <coughs> you get red and a range of red and pink colors and buff colors and brown colors in a dream normally. But the yellow and blue, sharp yellow and blue, do not normally occur in a subastral dream, but they do occur in an astral dream very clearly. So sometimes the colors can indicate, and those are so realistic that in the dream you feel you are more real than you were in the physical body. So those dreams are not really sub dreams. So you can have both kinds of dreams. Yes? Uh, it's for why do we dream? We dream to escape from the pressure of wakefulness. We wouldn't be able to survive without it. The living wakefulness, the pressure of our karma and the wakeful state is so heavy we need a break from it. And therefore, we go to another dimension called the dream. Okay. Yes? Is it possible, because they say in meditation it's like dying while living? Has anybody ever died in meditation? No. <laughs> Indeed, my dad, when he got initiated by great master, and he had the first experience, it, it appeared to him he was dying. He got frightened. He got so scared, he said, I'll never meditate again. 
because he felt that the whole of his life would be pulled out and the body is going away. So he said, no way. So he went to great master said, I'm not going to do your meditation. It's too scary. I was going to die. He, he laughed, great master laughed and he said, uh, you know, in our total experience, of all cases known to us, nobody has ever died in meditation. Nobody has ever died. They are off from meditation when they die. It's so arranged that meditation, which dying while living, gives you the same experience, but you're still living in the physical body. And also, he said, great master said, to take care of the scary part of it, he said, what do you expect if you really were to die? What would you expect to see? He said, I hope you are there. He said, I will be there. And therefore, there's nothing to be scared of. If one is initiated, it's guaranteed. The master will be there. You can test it out while dying, while living, that you will get the same experience. Yes. Uh, I've heard stories about yogis in caves who uh, go into a posture and then just never come back. Uh, it, it, yes, I said, BB, open your eyes and tell us what you're seeing. And the BB opened her eyes and she put her um, head on the master's feet and said, thank you very much for the wonderful experience I was having. And so far the little foot is concerned, it will heal. We just put some ointment on it and it will heal. Then in the presence of the doctor, great master said, tell me what you were seeing while you were in that state. He said, I was flying in this region, I flew into another region. And she began to describe a lot of internal experiences. Wow. So that was a great thing. And as it happens, since I was a neighbor, I saw this myself in my own eyes. So that means it's not a story I heard. Of course, you are hearing a story. But I saw it myself. So that is why the, uh, the, the experiences that we can have do not alter. In meditation, the vital signs do not alter. We breathe normally, our heart beats normally, and yet we experience death. <coughs> That's totally different from the experience of the yogis who do pranayama and breathing exercises. Yes. The difference between uh, vision and dream. Uh, the difference between vision and dream is that the dream uh, is inconsistent. It shifts very rapidly. The vision is more stable. It's a spiritual astral vision that takes place is more stable, more consistent. Actually, the, we ultimately begin to define our reality based upon consistency of experience. When we are awake in the physical body, things move consistently according to the law of cause and effect. And therefore, we think in the real. If things suddenly change, if we are sitting here, suddenly we are sitting on a sandy beach, and then we come back here, we'll think it's unreal. Because our belief of reality is, it has to be consistent continuously. Experience has to be, the vision, vision and spectacle we are having should be continuously consistent with cause and effect. Nothing can change without it. On the other hand, dream, it changes all the time. Yes, inside. So we broke open the door and we saw the lady in the medita meditation posture. But what we saw was that uh, because of some jaggery or brown sugar that was lying on the floor and she stepped on it, the foot was, that little piece of jaggery was attached to the foot and ants had been eating it up, and they ate up not only exactly, they were eating part of the foot also. They were eaten up as he was in that state. We ran and called the great master, whose house was not too far, that the baby is in a strange state, she might be dead, and the police come and see. So, so he came running to see the baby, and he said laughingly, now called Dr. Shakuntala. Dr. Shakuntala was a doctor living about 20 miles away who loved the great master and his white beard but didn't believe any of the words he ever spoke. <laughs> she said that is nonsense what he teaches because medical science does not agree with what he says. And she's a doc and she, I'm a doctor, medical <coughs> doctor. So I take things exactly. The body is constituted like this. There's nothing before or after this body. Is the only life and so on. <clears throat> so great master said, call Dr. Shakuntala now to examine this patient. So Dr. Shakuntala 
a car was sent and she came and she examined the patient. She said, she's in a very deep coma. She has been, she has gone into very deep coma. It's very difficult to revive her because you can see even her heel is being eaten up by ants and she's still not able to come to consciousness. So please shift her immediately to a major hospital. And great master said, when you are in such deep coma, what happens to the reflexes? What happens to the vital signs? He said, they alter also. He said, will you please check up? So he checked the pieces. She said, the heart is beating normally. The blood pressure is normal. The other vital signs are normal. This is a very unique case. I've never seen a case like this. He said, what about the reflexes of the muscles and so on? And she took that little hammer and knocked all over. She says, all the reflexes are normal. So. She said, this is a strange case. I know I've never seen a case like this, but you better move her to the hospital immediately. And great master said, do you know, she's having inner experiences. She's traveling in some Brahmans. She's traveling in some higher regions. And the doctor said, master, I love you. You're a very beautiful man, but this is no time for jokes. <laughs> Her life is in jeopardy. Please move her to the hospital. And great master said, well, I'm going to call her to wake up and tell you her experiences. She says, this is not time for this kind of stuff. And great master said, Bibi, open your eyes and tell us what you're seeing. And the Bibi opened her eyes and she put her um, head on the master's feet and said, thank you very much for the wonderful experience I was having. And so far the little foot is concerned, it'll heal. We just put some ointment on it and it'll heal. Then in the presence of the doctor, Great Master said, tell me what you were seeing while you were in that state. He said, I was flying in this region, I flew into another region, and she began to describe a lot of internal experiences. Wow. So that was a great thing. And as it happens, since I was a neighbor, I saw this myself in my own eyes. So that means it's not a story I heard. Of course, you are hearing a story, but I saw it myself. So that is why the, uh, the, the Experiences that we can have do not alter. In meditation, the vital signs do not alter. We breathe normally, our heart beats normally, and yet we experience death. <coughs> That's totally different from the experience of these yogis who do pranayama and breathing exercises. Okay. Yes? The difference between uh, vision and dream. Uh, the difference between vision and dream is that the dream uh, is inconsistent. It shifts very rapidly. The vision is more stable. It's a spiritual astral vision that takes place is more stable, more consistent. Actually, the, we ultimately begin to define our reality based upon consistency of experience. When we are awake in the physical body, things move consistently according to the law of cause and effect, and therefore we think it is real. If things suddenly change, if we are sitting here, suddenly we are sitting on a sandy beach, then we come back here, we'll think it's unreal. Because our belief of reality is, it has to be consistent continuously, experience has to be, the vision, vision and spectacle we are having should be continuously consistent with cause and effect. Nothing can change without it. On the other hand, dream, it changes all the time. Yes. Um. If you are in the practicing the healing arts, and how do you protect yourself? Is it with love and compassion? Yes. Switch yourself? Yes. Switch yourself to using your love and compassion for the person instead of using your energy. And that protects you? And that protects you. And if you still feel insecure, go back to your master. And he'll make sure you are protected. Yes. So back to the orange juice. If when you were either filling or um, raining, if there was a, a change or a turbulence or a difficulty in a place, what would you do to, you know, to have a, like a self sort of um, maintenance on yourself? What did you do? What did I do? Well, I had to put even more and more and more attention onto like a turbulent place that, you know, kind of didn't want to fill and got all confused and... You yeah, know, I just had to work it. Yeah, but so that's exactly the intention that you put your attention on it. Okay. The, the, the experiment is designed to utilize your attention. Mm -hmm. And if the attention 
goes to the experience of turbulence and so on, it's serving its purpose. The whole idea is, can you put your attention wherever you want? Whenever you're directed, do this, can you do it? Or does the attention flow by itself? The reason for this exercise is that if you allow the attention to move on the direction of the mind, which is very random, it moves from one thing to another all the time and is not under control. This is a way to control the movement of the attention. Okay? Yes. Yes, boy. Yeah, I, I have a question about uh, like a uh, uh, physical plane, uh, as I said, uh, is a harsh reflection of the uh, astral plane. Is there, there is there any synchronization? Like, for example, uh, if, if uh, I uh, raise my hand in a uh, physical or, or astral, uh, also the same happening in physical. Is there, is there any synchronization? Yes. It looks like it's, it's synchronized. When we are in the physical body, the astral system is totally synchronized with us. That means when we raise our hand, physical hand, we are also raising our astral hand at the same time. But during meditation, for example, if, if somebody has a, a experience in astral play, during meditation is sitting quietly, he's not raising hands. No, or no. When you withdraw your attention from the physical body, the synchronization stops. Oh, I see. It's only in the wakeful state that it's synchronized. When you go into dream state, lower than the physical state, even then the synchronization stops. Mm -hmm. If in the dream you walk, you don't walk with the body. Sometimes you do walk. That's called sleepwalking. <laughs> Sometimes you do sleep talking. Sometimes you move part of your body. And you always, almost always move your eye, uh, eyes. And the, you can see the eyelids moving when you're watching a dream. They call the rapid eye movement, which is uh, one of the methods of recognizing if a person sleeping is having a dream or not. Now when, uh, in the 60s when I came to this country, there used to be a lot of experiments going on on sleep, and sleep and dream. So I attended some of those courses myself here. In that they would uh, uh, put different kind of electrodes and so on to see. And they would take pictures of the eyes that the rapid eye movement was taking place. Every 15, 20 minutes, a person dreams, based on the fact that every 15 or 20 minutes, the rapid eye movement takes place. Most of the dreams we never remember. Almost nobody remembers all the dreams. Some say we never dream, but the uh, eye movement shows they were dreaming. Everybody dreams at night. Everybody dreams at night. Though they say we never dream because they don't remember their dreams. So the, the experiment was to see what is the movement of the eyelids. And when the movement of the eyelids was like this, up and down, and they woke up the person, what were you seeing? You say, oh, I was seeing a waterfall. I was seeing something in that direction, in the dream. The eyes are moving, synchronized with the pattern of the movement of the dream. And the eyes were moving like this, horizontally. They wake up the person, what were you seeing? I was seeing a tennis match. <laughs> So the, the description of the dreams fitted in with the eye movement. Sometimes the hand would move and they're taking continuous pictures, continuous uh, video of the thing. So they can associate how often you toss and turn in the bed and, and what you are dreaming at the time when you toss and turn. So they would wake up from time to time, the people. The most interesting thing I noticed there was that when a person was woken up in a very clear dream, and he described it. The tape recorded his description. When he woke up in the morning, did you have a dream? No. No dream at all. He said, do you remember some of these events? No. Do you remember that we recorded and you said this? No. And then they play the tape. He says, I can't believe it. That means that we can be so separated from our physical wakeful consciousness, from the dream consciousness, that it is like going into another area and coming back. There's a good reason for this. The reason is that if we remember all the dreams, it would be very hard to live here. So it's good to forget. If we remember all our astral experiences, it will be hard to live here. It's good to forget. First time I realized the importance and value of forgetfulness. <laughs> I always thought forgetting something is bad. And then I discovered it's good we forget. 
There are some events that take place in our life. If we keep on remembering them, we'll never be able to live the rest of our life. So that is why they coined this phrase, forgive and forget. When you forgive and forget, you have to forget also. Some people say, oh, I've forgiven that person, but I can't forget it. That's not forgiveness even. If you really forgive somebody, then you must forget also. And this forgetfulness is really responsible for all our wakeful experiences, all our astral experiences. If we don't have this forgetfulness, it will be very hard to continue with experience. So, the, so far as your question is concerned, yes, some synchronization exists, but very minor in the dream state, nor in the astral state. But in the wakeful state, it's not that the astral body is really sleeping. There's a little difference. When the physical body sleeps and you have a dream, the physical body is lying in bed and you are moving around in a, a dream body. Is it the dream body that is doing something to you or is it something totally different? Supposing while you are sleeping and having a dream, somebody moves your arm. Do you know you will have an immediate experience in the dream? If somebody shouts to you while you are sleeping and you are not awake, you can hear the shout in a different form in the dream. That be the triggers, the sensory triggers or sen stimuli that can come in a physical body affect immediately your dream. The same way, the astral systems, whatever is happening there, is affecting us here. It does not mean that the astral body is completely uh, sleeping at this time. It's just that it's embedded here and we are taking into account only a physical experience. There, there's a slight difference between wakeful physical state and dream and an astral state and wakeful state. Yes? Uh, when you're <coughs> potentially withdrawing from the body of meditation, can you talk about moving from astral to causal to, or mental to causal? Or what, what might happen in that? Well, what happens is that there is a connection between the astral and the causal. You go through an intermediate step. An intermediate situation there has been called the curve, the <coughs> crooked, crooked tunnel. Have you heard of the crooked tunnel? No. Bhakna. Bhakna is a connecting tunnel between the astral and the causal experience. It's crooked because if you're in the center of the tunnel, center of the experience, that's the only time that you can see two levels. That you can know that the astral level is being created here and that's the causal level from which it, it is being generated. Otherwise, each level shuts off the other level. If we go from the physical to the astral, and the astral world comes up and we are dead in this physical and we are not aware of it, it's just a complete change from one level to another. But when we change from the astral to the causal, then we have a connection in the middle of the experience where we know we are leaving the astral and we're moving to the causal. And that's called the crooked tunnel. And Kruger Tunnel itself is not a small tunnel. It's a vast experience by itself. So a lot of souls who are on the ascendance to higher consciousness, they are trapped in the Kruger Tunnel itself. And, but they think that they have reached the final knowledge, area of knowledge, because they can have the knowledge of the created world, astral and physical. They can have the knowledge of the creator, creating world, which is a causal world. The truth is that's only a trap. It's only a trap because it is only giving you visions of both sides, but it does not really take you into the causal experience. Once you transcend that experience, which is common to both, then you go to the causal experience, which is an experience in which the sensory perceptions have been left behind. Because like the physical body is left behind, and the physical matter does not count anymore in the astral self. From astral to causal, the sensory perceptions are no longer needed. The power of perception is grasped by your mind itself. The mind grasps in one go all that today we think has to be touched and smelt and seen and so on. So the grasp of the mind in the causal plane is instant and immediate. It does not require that you spell it out through different senses. And yet, all the experience of the different senses which we have here can be picked up by the mind by its direct grasp of an experience. That's one big difference. Very difficult to explain 
uh, that because we never have it here. But some notion of it you can get that the mind is capable of a grasp of something. It is like uh, uh, like reading a page of a book line by line or seeing the whole page together. So you see the whole uh, scene together. That's one big difference. The second is that concepts which we have created, which are the generating uh, instruments for ideas, and ideas being the instruments for physical things and beings, those concepts are living things there. That means we don't have bodies here. You could be a concept. You can be born, incarnated as a concept, oh. and move around there. You could be moving around as a abstract shape or something. So those are conceptual things, and they are living entities, and souls can occupy them and make them alive, like we make these bodies alive here. Sort of like uh, mystics, uh, uh, some people in some mystical past talk about thought, projecting thought forms. The thought forms, form yes. Like that, uh, thought forms, all form. thought forms can be used as active forms of life there. That's one thing. Secondly, the speed at which you can move through the area, which is very slow here, and becomes very fast, faster than the velocity of light in the astral plane, becomes still faster than the velocity of thought. That you can think of any place, anywhere, you are there. So that's another difference there. Mm -hmm. So the causal plane it has another feature that you can meet and get into the top of the causal plane, the top of frequency in the universal mind. And you'll find that the mind itself, which is individuated in us and attached to the soul, also has its own universality. Like the soul has a totality of consciousness higher up, the mind itself has a totality of its own. That all minds are one, in fact. And they are split for experience sake and attached to the souls at that level in the second plate cause of space. That's another great experience. There are many other experiences which are difficult to describe. And anything above is totally difficult. But we do try to say something as an incentive to go higher. Swamiji of Agra, who founded the Radha Swami faith, he used to describe in his discourses what happens in Parabrahm and such kind. Yeah. He used to say there are tall trees, several miles tall, and on them are hanging not fruits, but diamonds, rubies, jewelry. I must tell you, most of his disciples were women. <laughs> <laughs> and he was asked, really, are there trees there? He says, how can there be trees when there is no space and no time? <laughs> but I have to give some description <laughs> to make it attractive in us, enough for you to meditate. <laughs> Master. Yes. Uh, okay, ju uh, jewel first. Okay. Ladies first. What, yes, what do all of the, these souls do if they get to such kind? They, they're not bored. What in heaven's name are they doing up there? <laughs> they're dancing and singing. I have to use the same Swamiji's method. Hanging on the trees, but they're dancing, See, singing, enjoying I, themselves. I don't tell them, but they don't tell me what they're doing. There are two kinds of souls in Sachkant. Our okay. true home, okay. our true home is where we really belong, from where we have come, and I where we really there. belong, and I we will all go there. there. That's what perfect living masters have guaranteed to us, we will go there. So when we go there, we find there are many souls there, many more souls than ever came here into this whole universe in the totality of time. So therefore, what are those souls doing there? They're singing, dancing in bliss and joy, they're very happy. And when we reach there, there's a difference between us and them, because they never came out, they never had this experience of pain and pleasure. They never had this experience of physical bodies. They never had the experience of a mind. They never had experience of thinking. They never had any of these experiences. And we go laden with all this experience. So we go heavy and we look at them. We're heavy then. We are heavy because we have got all the experience with us. They have no experience of the physical world. So when we reach there, 
we dance with them and we are so happy to be back home and we sing and dance more than they do because we are back, back home and we are so happy and they ask us why are you so happy what's so special about you what is so special about you that you are dancing more than us we have been here in such kind all the time and we tell them you don't know what you're missing <laughs> because you never had this experience. And we appreciate coming back home, which you can't appreciate because you never left home. So there is some truth in that too. Well, it's kind of weird though. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It, it looks weird, yes. <laughs> any, any other question or comment? Yes, Gary. The physical world it seems to me that it's easier for me to focus on the visual. I, I'm, a, I'm a painter, as you know, and I try to translate that in my work. You know, when I go in, you know, it's easy for me to visualize. It's harder for me to, to make it physically, just a painting piece, to hear the sounds in the painting and, and uh, you know, smell the things in the painting. <coughs> seems to be distinct membranes for these five sensory apparatus that we use. And you're set telling, you're saying today that the, the causal dimension it seems to be more one and, and, and all sorts of things all together, less membrane divisions, etc. If the one is, is really what we're talking about and it's there with us right now in that form, is there any way to make that one more evident than the physical? <clears throat> the truth is that we never function separately from one level to another. It's not that now we are physical, everything else is gone. And when we go there, this goes away. Everything is always intact. It's only our experience changes. If we did not have the experience of being in such country today at this time, we could not be alive here. If we did not have the experience of being individuated soul in Parabrahm, we couldn't be here. If we did not have the experience of being in the universal mind and in Trikuti, we wouldn't be here. If we did not have the experience of the astral plane right now going on, we wouldn't be here. If any of those are plugged out, everything below it dies. Therefore, it's not that only one is functioning, all of them are functioning. Not only that, when we are here, and a certain imaginary idea comes, inspiration comes, and a painter paints out something that he never thought of even. It comes from an inspiration from inside. A poet writes a poetry that he couldn't believe he could have written. It is so inspirational. An artist performs in a certain way. Where do these come from? They're coming because the astral activity is still on, but he's, his attention is on the physical. If a person can think today, where is he thinking from? He's not thinking from the physical. It's the same mind from the, ast uh, from the causal that continues to function in the astral and the physical. We only give it a different name. The mind that is in the physical, we say Bindima, that means the physical mind. In the astral, we say Andima, the astral mind. And Brahmandima, the true mind of the causal plane. These names are given because we are wrapped over with the experience of these levels of consciousness. But the operation of the mind is still from the causal. The operation of the soul, consciousness, is still from Parabrahm and from Sachkan. We never close down those because all the power is coming from there. That makes us alive at every level. Supposing you are in a dream, having a dream, and you die in the physical body, dream ends. You cannot have a dream. If you are having a physical body and the anything above it dies, you can't be here. So therefore, the entire system is preserved continuously and operates jointly as one system. And the oneness never disappears, nor does the loneliness disappear at any time. Because of the oneness, the loneliness stays. If you discover that you are only one, would you like to go there? If somebody is told that, look, here you have a lot of company, you enjoy lots of nice food and pizza with people who you love, like Huey, and now you'll go one day to a place where there's only one, and you merge in that one and become one. 
Who would like it? Not me. I want company. I want the experience of love, to be loved and love somebody. How will I do that if there's only one? So the oneness of the reality is haunting people through loneliness. They're lonely at every level. But they discover then later on that the oneness is not really one. The one and the many are experienced simultaneously in such kind. The one and the many are experienced simultaneously at certain levels. The one and the many are experienced in thoughts simultaneously in the causal plane. So because the multiplicity of, of experiences can be put together in those levels, we are never really lonely. It looks lonely to us because of the con conceptually we have been told it's only one. All right, supposing you have been frightened by the fact that we are going to the top, there is only one. And that's going to be more lonely than we ever had here. Why should we go there? Then the perfect living masters come here and say that if you are initiated by a perfect living master, right from the astral stage, you are never alone. You are in the company of the perfect living master. And that goes on all the way to such come. And you are never alone. So that's a very good solution, even for the conceptual loneliness, that you always have a companion, a friend, and nothing can beat that friend in friendship. That friend is there all the time, unconditionally with you. I've never seen that kind of unconditional friendship and love in this world, which I can find with a perfect living master. But the perfect living master does not judge. He is not critical of anything. He knows we are in a trap. <coughs> he knows already in what a great muddle we have put ourselves through our karma. And he's trying to help us out. He's not trying to judge us, criticize us. He's trying to help us all the time. You can't find a better friend than that. And he's a friend who loves you unconditionally. If you love him, you receive the love back and you feel it. If you don't love him, you st he still loves you. If you hate him, he still loves you. If you kill him, he still loves you. What kind of friendship is that? What kind of love is that? Only perfect living master can exhibit that. Because he has experienced simultaneously the oneness of all and the manyness of us here. Simultaneously. So the, when we have these spiritual experiences in meditation and we go from one level to another, at one time we have only one level as our reality. We are in the physical plane, this is real. We go to sleep and have a dream, that becomes real for the time being. We wake up, this becomes real. We go to the astral plane and we are dead to the physical plane, the astral plane alone becomes our reality. We go to the causal plane, the causal plane alone becomes our reality. We go to the spiritual planes, everything else is lost. We have awareness of only one plane. But when you reach such current, you have the consciousness of all the planes at once. The perfect living masters who operate from that level, then you see them as human beings sitting with us. They're not operating as only human beings. And in their body, in their shape, in their appearance, in their life, in their karma, they are like us, exactly. No difference. But in their consciousness, they are operating directly from all levels. And they are taking care of people at all levels. They are not only taking care of people who happen to be at that time in the physical plane. So the viewpoint of a perfect living master is totally different, even from the viewpoint of one who has ascended stage by stage and got those experiences. It's only when you reach the final stage that you get this grasp of the wholeness of the experience, the wholeness of experience at all levels. Otherwise, it's only partial. Yes, Chuck. This is on a different subject, but I would like to have your opinion on what the ancient astronauts are as portrayed on the History Channel on TV. What about them? I'm asking you. <laughs> yeah, they were old astronauts who could travel from different systems in the galaxies. And they had uh, the power to bend time. They had the power, they had uh, got technologies to bend time, space. And because of that, their travel was very easy and not at all difficult. Whereas we can't do that yet. 
and we are experimenting with that. One day we'll be like those astronauts also in this physical world in this planet. You mentioned one other time that there are about 3,500 years ahead of us. Is that Approximately, yes, because uh, a great master once gave me that wonderful experience of a glimpse into a not too far off, uh, an experience, glimpse of what will be life on the planet in 4000 AD, which is only 2000 years ahead. Even by 4000 AD, the glimpse I had showed that technology has advanced to such a level that we all, everybody's age has been controlled. Disease has been wiped out completely. We are traveling in space, living in space. We're living in space uh, habitations, a number of them all around. This planet has been used as a garbage bag, and we dump all the garbage from satellites into this. So very, that was a bad view of the Earth planet, because we are constantly saying, save the Earth, save the planet, save the planet and I find that we were never able to save it in the long run. And then this earth is being used to drop dead bodies. Bodies can be produced up there and dropped here. All garbage is dropped here, is generated there in space. All, and all the people of that age are wondering how ignorant we were, how primitive we were to waste our resources on building roads, on building buildings and universities, when you can fly easily. Why have a road? There was, they can't understand why surface transportation was necessary at all. They can't understand why colleges and universities were ever made when the whole of the knowledge can be transferred electronically from one brain to another. How all the knowledge can be collected in one place and all distributed electronically to all people, living people, so they all have the same learning, same knowledge, and it's all real democracy. Why didn't we do that? How could we have different political systems? How could we have all this? There's only one system available. That's a very interesting vision. That's one of the reasons we've had plagues over the centuries, because of the garbage that's been dumped on the earth. Yes. Will we come back in a different body to know that then? Yeah. If you want to, yes. Well, Would just, you like to come back? I just as soon go home to Sat Khan and talk to the angels and be with them. OK, you better stay there then. <laughs> don't have to come back. Pardon me? Don't have to come back. You can get a little view uh, through a telescope from there. Yeah, I like to see that. <laughs> I see you, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, um, back to healing. What about spontaneous healing? Like when someone didn't intend to, but like you show an ailment to someone and they tell it and then it's gone. What, what happens there? Very often it's compassion and love that does it. That's like spiritual healing. Okay, so there's no karma involved? No, no, not in spiritual healing. In love and compassion, there's no karma involved. Which means that one who has compassion can, can be doing that all the time. Yes, absolutely. That should be done. That all the time. Yes. Frequently the masters mentioned that a family pet was a past soul in the family of the human form. Where does that transition take place where the human soul is compressed down into, say, like a dog, and then when the dog dies, it goes up to the, immediately in the after plane to become a human form, or does it remain in the dog form? Which, how does that transition take place, and where does it take place? <clears throat> the karma works in a strange way that the karmic intentions and activities we have in our mind during a lifetime as a human being they get recorded and get translated into different life forms that we go through. It is not necessary that we necessarily have one type of life form. The karma can be translated because of this action. You should be a tree for 30 years. Because of this action, your mental action, because of what you did, you should be a dog for so long. Because of this action, you should be a bird because of this action, you should be an angel. Because of this action, you should be in heaven for 30 days. Okay? There's a whole complex of different forms created by one lifetime of karma. So you die in this physical body. You start from the bottom. You start from a tree. The soul is then transferred. The same soul, same mind, same astral body. It's not different. 
the same soul, the same mind, the same astral body is transferred to these and they then take root in those different forms and they ascend. Fortunately, the ascending is in the same order Darwin predicted. Darwin was saying that this is how we evolved. The truth is that the karma takes us through the same evolution, but need not be all the species, picked up species based on our karma. Where do you shed the, for instance, the plant has water and the human has all five chakras? How do you shed, how are those shed in, in, as you're coming down and it's like you have to become a tree? They are, they are shed automatically um, because the tree holds the water element or the element that is predominant in any one of these species is held, the others are subdued. They kept subdued till we rise to the other level than the others awaken up. The fifth element, of course, which is uh, the element of uh, deliberative consciousness, the power of thinking and deciding, that comes only in the human being. And that is what is responsible for all karma anyway. We would not have any karma if the fifth sense did not come up, which is the sense that gives us the idea that we have free will and free choice. So when the cycle comes up to the physical level, if you get initiated, you don't become a dog. And initiate because all past karmas have gone, only one karma is left, and you do not normally, as an initiate, do anything to be a dog. So therefore, it's almost unknown that an initiate has ever become an animal. But there was one well-known case, which was recited by a great master, and I'll tell you that case now, where an initiate became a bear. What? An initiate of a master became a bear, and the, ma the next master, before whom the bear appeared, uh, uh, was uh, able to take him back into human realm. The story goes like this. It's one of the Sikh gurus that he was holding a discourse. In the discourse, a man with a bear and monkeys, they have these bear shows, you know, they tied up up in India, it's very common. A man came with a bear and stood at the back of the satsang that was being held. And the master stopped his satsang. And he looked at the bear and he said, gentlemen, today I have to tell you a story why that bear has come to us today. The bear was a human being in his past life. The bear was a disciple of my master. And everybody was shocked. How could a disciple of your master become a bear? He said, it's a very tough decision that was made. And I'll tell you the story. This bear was not only a disciple of my master, he was also a prominent sevadar. He did service and his prominent seva was to distribute prashad at the end of the discourse. And one day, three of the most beloved disciples of that master, who were farmers, were going in their bullock carts on the road. And they saw that the satsang has just ended. And they came running, leaving the bullocks to keep on dragging the carts that we'll run, get a prashad, and run back in the further part of the road and catch up. So they ran, and this man, the Sevadar, was distributing the prashad from a little tray or something. And he said, wait for your turn. They said, our bullocks are running away, and can we not get the prashad, immediately a little bit of prashad, so that we can go and catch up our bullets. He said, wait, because they were full of dirt and dust on their bodies having come from the farm. From the farm. And this man, while admonishing them, said, go away, you bears. And when he said, go away, you bears, a little part of the prashad fell from his hand on the ground. And one of those gurmukhs picked up that and put it in his mouth and said, we are not bears. You might be one. The master said, that word of the Golmuk could not be changed. I had to give this life. My master had to give this life. And he has done his innings as a bear. And he's come today. He said, give him some prashad now. So they gave the prashad to the bear. 
and he died instantly there. This story is told to show that there is a rare exception where a Gurmukh's word, even a guru will not turn away. And when a, such a, a devoted soul says something, the gurus do not say no. So that's a rare exception. Otherwise, uh, initiates normally not only get another human life, if they have to. The other day, somebody came to ask me about this uh, concept of four lives in Chicago. And he said that uh, one of the current gurus, there are many gurus today, you know, and I respect all of them because they're all teaching people the same kind of teaching that great master taught. They all say, go within yourself and find out. So I like them because they're teaching how to go within, which is the correct direction. How far they can take somebody depends on how far they have gone. So I, I respect them because they're giving the right track, but I make no judgment on their um, level of achievement themselves. This depends on how much they've got. But the question was that one guru said that he had never heard of the four lives. And uh, Swamiji, in his Sarbachan, one of his standard texts, says that, that there are four lives to reach salvation. Ek janam gur bhakti. That means one life is good enough for developing your devotion for a guru. Janam dusre naam. You get the naam for initiation the second life. Janam tesre turiyapad. In the third life, if you get to the causal plane, it's very good. Chorthe me nijdham. In the fourth, you can go to Sajkat. So, see, since this poem is there, and he's referring to four lifetimes of work in order to reach our true home, so the question always has come up, do we all have to go through four lives? To answer this question of this gentleman who came to me, I had to refer to him to my own father's story, who was a disciple of Great Master. And he went to Great Master because he missed a discourse. He was not present in the Sabsang, he reached late. And he went to Master and said, I understand. In today's Sabsang, in today's discourse, you said that a human being cannot have after initiation more than four lives. Is that true? <coughs> and my uh, and Great Master told my dad, Lake Raj, why are you worried about it? This is your last life. Why are you worried about four lives? He said, no, Master. I was thinking, supposing I want five. <laughs> is there a bar to having five lives? He said, why would you have five lives? He says, I understand sometimes Master themselves come back again and again. And Great Master, if you happen to come back for the fifth one, I want to have a fifth life. He said, don't worry. Then he explained. He said, if a person is initiated by a perfect living master and follows his directions and does his meditation, follows the other instructions he gives about diet and way of living and so on, it is certain that man will go in the same way. That's his final life. If a person gets initiated but does not follow the instructions fully, tries his best but slips now and then, is likely to get a second life, but the second life will be better than the first life. It will not carry the burden of the old son's scars of previous lives. And it will be based only on the karma of one life, therefore it will be a better life, and he will get more facilities in the second life to meditate. If a person gives up the path in one life and has to come again, he may come for the third life. But in no case, if a person goes against the master, and works against him, he may come for the fourth life. So he said, Lake Raj, the question of four lives doesn't arise for a person who is following the instructions of the master, so don't worry. That was an interesting uh, discovery for me that four lives is not for everybody. Four lives is for those who are really, really not following the path and yet got initiation because of recommendation of friends because Master's compassion came at that point as a human being, he had compassion for that person <laughs> and initiated him. So therefore, the four life theory can be interpreted any way you like, but it's not necessary to go through four lives. But we do not know any cases where there is more than four human lives. 
for a person who's initiated by a perfect living master to come to the fifth life. I don't think anybody has come. But remember, four lives does not really mean that you go to such karma in four lives. Although Swamiji says in that book that uh, each life can take you up to one step forward and the fourth you can reach the top. Not everybody reaches the top for reasons of their own desires and inclinations in this human life. If you have a lot of aesthetic desires, you're an artist, you like to paint things that you see around you, and you are so much absorbed in them, and then you go to the astral plane. The astral plane has more attractive things than you have ever seen in the physical plane. And you're drawn to that plane for a long time. And therefore, the tendency to stay there longer is so strong that you will not like to move forward to such kind, thinking this is the best place to be in. Till you see something higher, you think every stage is the final stage. That's how the experience looks like. At every stage looks like it is such kind. And only when you see something better and higher, you discover there was something better and higher. So there are souls who are working on the spiritual path in the astral plane, being taken care of by the same masters who initiated them finally in the fourth life, or whatever life was, after which they are not reborn into the physical world. And those masters stay with them in the same form, sometimes for a thousand years. There are some souls in the astral plane who are still there and are moving so slowly up because of their own desire and attractions to those kind of experiences which they're having there. Sometimes the masters won't let you do that, knowing that you are too fond of those things and may get stuck there, so they put blinders on you. And they take you through the astral stages blindly. They put blinders and won't let you see it. Then they take you to the causal plane, let you see it, then they say, now let's go back to the astral plane. And then you don't want to stick there, because you've seen something better. So the master sometimes employ the trick of the blindfold. It's called a blindfold trick. <laughs> In the manual for perfect living masters, it's so described. <laughs> yes. If your family pet dies and the ma you're initiated, and the master says that he'll take care of your family prior to and after, including your pets, when the astral form of that dog leaves, does it in the astral? level change back to a human form and a human form or yes, does it run yes. around as a dog? Changes back into human form and born as a human form. That's, that's yes. <laughs> yes. Are, are, are humans exclusive to this planet or are there humans or humanoids on other? Yes, there are many other planets also. But their, uh, their bodies are somewhat different. They're, Laws governing those bodies are different. Their experiences are different because uh, there is one similar planet with similar beings like us where, I'm just giving you an example. Yeah, yeah, Since levels of technology are different and growth of technology is different in different places, there they have a control over time. Now once again, like a visit to the 4000 AD, I got a glimpse into that too some time back, and I saw that each person controls his own time and does not follow a single time. That means you could be with me here today and you could be tomorrow earlier than me. It doesn't make sense here. It makes total sense to them. They live like that. So there are some strange differences even in the laws of nature there. And those laws operate differently. But they are human in the sense by our definition, they're human because they experience free will. The definition of a human being is not the shape, not what laws he's following, but whether he's experiencing free will and can create karma. That's the definition of a human being. Is his ultimate destiny then such consciousness? That species that you were talking about, is his destiny such consciousness? Mean, Same such consciousness. There happens to be only one such kind. Unfortunately, there's only one such kind. <laughs> yes. I was wondering about all those people who died in 911 10 years ago, if they lived on in their afterlife, so they still are. Yes. The reason for that is that when you have a death which we think is an accidental death, 
like a murder, like a suicide, like uh, an accidental death through an accident. The astral body has designed a notional life for the physical body. And the notional life continues for a reasonable amount of time, which has been designed to accommodate that karma. Nor normal life at certain times is 70, 80, 100, 150. Supposing the no notional life of a person is 80 years old, accident takes place at age 40, and he dies, physical body. For the remaining 40 years of the notional life, he remains in the sub-astral region overlapping this. He remains in the overlap region of the physical and the astral. Very often in the same location where he died, sometimes able to move to other places. The disembodied spirits are all the time there, and they are created by this kind of accident. Yes? <clears throat> Quick question. Yes. Is it possible to become so concerned for another's health that the attraction there will bring over a possibility of contracting the same malady as the person that a person is concerned with? Yes, it's possible. So we can love too much. It's not love, it's concern. concern. There's a difference between love and concern. Thank you. Big difference between love and concern. Yes, Rick? If um, we die and we have to come back, do, can we go to another planet or we, would we come back here? You normally come back here because all your attachments are here. It's the attachments that pull you back. Whatever you're attached to, they pull you back, and they become part of your next life. So if you're attached to the master, and the master comes back, you come back with them? It's sure, you use your free will for that. <laughs> when you use your free will, now I must tell you something very interesting about this nature of free will that we only experience in the physical plane as a human being. We don't experience this in any other form. It's a unique uh, experience to have the power to make a decision that we have to decide this. We have options open. We have different ways to go. Sometimes we are left with no option but to decide which way to go. So this experience of free will takes place and is the basis for all karma. It's the free will. If something happens accidentally, no karma is created. It's just being paid off. All things that happen spontaneously without our deliberate decision making or past karma and payoff of karma. On the other hand, where we decide, should I do this or that, this or that, that's creating new karma, okay? Now when we have attachments here, it's our free will that makes us have this. If your free will says, I want to be with the master only, you'll be with the master only. There's no question. Wherever the master is, you will be there. So that, supposing a person wants something here and dies and does not return here, he fulfills that either in the astral plane because fulfillment of karma can take place at any level. It can take place in a dream, it can take place in the physical life, it can take place in the astral life. So you could be achieving something that you couldn't achieve here in the astral plane also, even attachments. If you're attached to something in the astral plane, you stay there. We'll have a break. We'll have a break for lunch. We'll meet for serious meditation in the afternoon. Don't get frightened. Seriously.